Morning, everyone. It's great to be here today with everyone. And I've been really enjoying the recent two talks so far in GeekConf, and I'm sure you have too. And so today I'm going to be talking about implementing open source based motion controlled robotic arms with Python and C. Plus plus. And my name is Renali Gona Spirito, as introduced, and I am the founder of Gray Studio, which is an IoT based startup. So without further ado, I'm just going to get right in. And of course, we're going like, to have an interesting demo as well at the end. So as you can see, there's a pair of like, uh, robotic hands ready there as well, which has been like, getting a lot of attention. So that's pretty good. And yeah, let's dive right in. So the motivation for this won't be too hard because, well, when I first went, made this after all, like first motivation of Pacific Rim, I mean, I'm sure everyone here, well, probably a majority of the audience here have seen Pacific Rim, yeah? Like, it's a pretty famous uh, movie uh, recently that was like, uh, no, it's actually not recent. It's been quite some time that's been released. But I guess that I could call that like one of the most main inspirations that inspired me to actually like go into making robotic arms. Because just imagine, like, once you have your robotic arms, like, how hard would it be to eventually also be able to like make the body of the robot as well. And eventually, who knows, like one day we may be actually seeing like real Pacific Rims as well, like Jaegers as well, like being able to actually like wield the whole robot and being able to control the whole robot because in today's project, this is basically a part of the robotic itself, which is basically being able to control robotic arms to be able to pick up objects, for example, or kind of like just like grasp, uh, putting your hands together or stuff like that. So. Like when you think about it, actually the future isn't that far off from being able to be, reach something as like Pacific Rim. So first of all, of course, we need to introduce as well why Python and C++ in Mechatronics. Uh, so firstly, both support object-oriented programming and this is especially important because in terms of mechatronics, in terms of like robotic development such as this one, it's very important that we organize our projects into objects. So, of course, because, well, the two main objects that we would need to move are the hands, of course, and we have those two as like separate files, which I'll talk about more as well after this. But essentially, because we are essentially going with object-oriented, it's very essential that we have languages that support that. And because when we be, uh, are trying to move robotic hands like this, we need to consider many different things including like its degrees of freedom and basically also like how we choose to also like make the connection, how we choose to be able to like create the movements between the axes. So that's all like part of the considerations, which is why it's important to split these all components into different objects. And also C complements Python with the ability to program real life and real time embedded controls and others. So this is especially important because Essentially, now with this, we're able to also like move things in real time. So, because with robotic arm movement, we want it to, things to be in real time movement. We want it to be responsive to what we are doing currently, and we want it to directly be responsive to what we're commanding it to do. So, essentially, with being able to put it in real time and like have as less delays as possible, it is crucial to be able to have the best possible uh, performance from the robot. And of course, Python is uh, well known for ROS. Uh, has anyone in the audience here have used ROS before? It's a pretty popular Python-based library. And it's pretty well known and pretty doc well documented for being able to like, control robotics-based operating systems. So it's also another thing that Python is strong in, and which is why I also went with Python in this. And shortly, I'll also be describing why, in particular, like Python and C can be interchangeable and are able to communicate efficiently. So these are two main components in my project, essentially the two main hardware. So firstly, a leap motion controller, as you can see over here, a leap motion controller. I have one over here. And essentially, um, have it, has anyone here played with leap motion controls before? Oh, quite a few. It's a pretty good technology because it's essentially like in this project especially like it's able to capture your coordinates of your hands and essentially it captures in very good detail as well. It can capture your hand and and like kind of like be uh, able enables you to be able to like record 
basically like each bone and kind of like puts places coordinates on each of your bone, which is what is very crucial for the movement of such a project. Because with this, you're able to make the movements fluid and you're able to also control what you want to also portray with basically your hands, which is what you're putting through. And of course, the eight degree of freedom robotic arm. And as you can see, there's a right and left hand. And of course, with a servo, with a and of like five fingers claw as well. So essentially, this is, I would call this like an open source thing because like it isn't too hard to get your hands on one of these. Like, I mean, I got this one just on randomly on AliExpress, just randomly like searching it up and yeah, found it. So like, it's definitely available and like it's not too expensive as well to start like a project like this. So it's definitely a good thing to start as well and just like give, give it a try. So that's like the main components hardware wise of the project. And of course, um, and as a control module, I'm using an ESP32. Essentially, this is where the C++ comes in, and I'll talk more about this shortly. And essentially, as mentioned before, with the real-time process of being able to make the measurements and being able to communicate the data between C and Python, we rely on asynchronous programming. Essentially, two different programs are made separately for each hand, which I'll go into for further shortly. And also, there's identical functionality as well because of this concept. And essentially, uh, we'll, we've been co covering actually um, process connection as well in the previous talks as well. But uh, I'm just going to reiterate as well in a bit. And like you guys may have already like find this a bit similar to the previous ones, or you might guess already know this. But I'm just going to do this in the context of this. So essentially, of course, just the connection request sent basically is the first step. And after that, the ESP32 will serve as the control module, will receive uh, this connection request. Essentially, this is where the C++ comes in. So essentially, it'll be able to like receive the C, basically the module, and essentially, it will convert coordinates from sensors that are retrieved within the leap motion sensor towards the controls of the ESP32, because the ESP32 is controlling the hands, essentially and this will move the robot. So essentially, that's how the conversion is done. And of course, that's where we do the switching from Python to C. And essentially, in a robot, this is the robotic arm connection architecture. So as you can see, we have two main environments. So firstly, the software environment, and the second is the physical environment. So First of all, in a software environment, we have leap motion control, which consists of leap motion control and Python script. Essentially, afterwards, it transfers the, the connection towards the mediator Python code. And essentially, we, through the Python code, we're able to then transfer it towards the controlling C++ script, for which is going to control the ESP2 microcontroller. And essentially, this controls the arm that we are trying to put forward. And essentially, that helps to also operate the robotic arm within a physical environment. So this is a short kind of uh, walkthrough on like how the operation works and how the conversion works. And essentially, this is how uh, we're able to transfer from just a simple motion sensor, capturing coordinates here, eventually being able to send it towards the actuators, the controllers there, and the ASP32 towards controlling the robotic arm. And this is a simple brief uh, showcase of the architecture. So as you can see, it's a simple kind of um, folder architecture. So just having like a, each of the, like basically each of the hands have two different files uh, supporting them. So firstly is a Arduino based file because um, I did the programming in Arduino for the ESP32. So one for the left hand and one for the right hand as you can see. So, and of course two Python files as well. A left for a left hand, right hand as well. And in the scaling of the project, these are some of the biggest challenges. Uh, it's always being able to allow for multiple ARMC program. That's always a consideration that needs to be taken into account of. Of course, also being able to develop for open source usage and ultimately allowing for smart controls because essentially one of the most important things in such a project is being able to also like transport it to or it's, um, IoT based applications as well. And essentially, this will in turn allow for uh, controls for being able to control it through the internet, for example, or being able to send analytics of what you're putting through, 
of the coordinates that you're retrieving towards the internet. So this is always a potential area of interest as well. And this is what I'm going to also talk about as well briefly in the, after this. And of course, industry-based implementations is also another big thing within scaling projects. And of course, uh, changing of sensors. Uh, it's always important to also experiment with what works. I'm, like um, when I was talking this about this project to like some of my uh, peers as well and some of uh, people who have played with this uh, thing as well, um, people are always talking about uh, why you use leap motion, why don't you use like uh, this X technology or Y technology, and so it's always depending on like uh, play around like what word works and ultimately being able to also kind of just like get a good grasp of how you're able to operate the device well and how what's the basic frameworks that is needed and. It's all about experimentation. And just a bit of like background as well on the skeletal tracking system. So this is something from the official Leap Motion page, not meaning to make this into a biology class, but just a bit of well, kind of like a walkthrough as well. So essentially, this is how it tracks uh, different coordinates within the hand. So essentially, the Leap Motion is able to retrieve and send back coordinates about these particular parts of the hand still flanges, intermediate flanges, proximal, and of course, they're all labeled according to color, so you can see which one connects to which. And essentially, this is how uh, we're, uh, we're able to actually re refer to coordinates afterwards, and ultimately being able to retrieve like each of the data from uh, required coordinate within the arms so that we're able to uh, record as precisely as how we want it to be when we're moving around our hand. So, we're gonna get into a bit of co uh, coding now, and this is gonna bit a bit, get a bit technical, so I ho hope you bear with me, because don't worry, at the end, we're gonna have a really fun demo where I'm gonna get like two volunteers to come up and test out the hands as well, because, well, seeing is not only believing, right? It's being able to try it directly when you start believing that actually is a cool thing, so let's get through the technical bit for now. And yep, so, Testing suits. So, firstly, we do have a like we and within testing suits, we do have like a couple of tests as well that we usually uh, I personally like perform as well when I try to test different uh, this program as well. So, particularly printing out the fingers as you can see over here, and particularly also being able to uh, put like uh, basically print out the fingers while also like printing out the format as well. Like this is always a good first step when testing like the how these hands are being able to retrieve the coordinates and essentially making sure that the coordinates are retrieved well enough. And so now we're still in the Python environment. So essentially for this one, we are basically uh, putting it as a listener. So essentially we're creating a, a listener class in our Python and we're, we're basically retrieving data from the current um, fingers and hands that we have already have here. And essentially, we have different functions, as you can see over here, basically like functions to initialize, connect, disconnect, uh, exit, and frame. So it's pretty self-explanatory. And essentially, we're able to also, uh, and as you can see, I've managed to also uh, particularly specify which are finger names and which are bow names so that we're able to uh, refer to it later within the program. And particularly, we also have a particular cycle as well for hands. So uh, as you can see, we're putting a for loop, and essentially what we want to do here is that we're checking whether it's a left hand or a right hand, and depending on that, we're able to also consider uh, putting in like uh, the particular direction uh, roll, like as you can see some terms as well, like pitch, roll, yaw, and essentially what we want to do is basically we're converting each of the things that are obtained from leap motion sensor into degrees. And also, uh, before as well, like uh, Leap Motion has a particular library as well that we can use. Uh, and it's an extensive library, so I encourage everyone to check it out as well if you're interested in Leap Motion technology after this talk. So it's definitely something to check out because they already have a lot of inbuilt functions as well that you can also play around with. So definitely check it out. And essentially, uh, we're converting from Leap Motion with uh, some particular mathematical constants, for, for, for example, like rad, radius to degrees and radians to degrees and being able to capture those coordinates and essentially being able to put it into the palm and essentially being able to also like transport the coordinates and uh, basically print out like what's necessary. It's a bit of a long piece of code, but essentially, in particular this one, in 
is, and it has the function of being able to identify the bones and obtain the coordinates. So for this one, we are obtaining each coordinate of fingers. So as you can see, we are basically uh, looping over the fingers, um, uh, the, the, basically the array of fingers as well, as was, was basically mentioned before. And what we want to do here is basically obtain the coordinates and basically also put a direction towards basic each of the fingers. So we're doing a bit of math here as well. So we retrieve like the 3D space in coordinates. So we have the, the X, Y, Z basically coordinates of that of like the, the first like um, the first finger. So basically in partic one particular finger, we're basically capturing one particular end of the finger and for the X2, Y2, Z2, we're essentially being able to also capture the next end of the finger. And what we want to do eventually is to be able to calculate the length of the finger so that we're able to also calculate where it is in space when we move it around. And that's what the math formula is there for, to be able to calculate the distance between those two lengths. So as you can see, we have the math dot square root, and that's what we want to do. So essentially, uh, obtaining that will be able to eventually calculate the total amount of like uh, the total length as well from one particular section to like the next and, and the other sections as well. So that's essentially how we're able to also kind of like get the total length. And also, so as you can see, this is repeated for uh, each of the bones as well. And for example, for metacarpal, proximal, distal, thumb. So we're obtaining uh, every one of this for each of these parts at sections, and eventually we're using this to be able to capture the coordinates and in the end be able to format it as uh, finger in degrees. So eventually we're able to also output the format and be able to uh, call, give like the, the right coordinates for it to transport towards moving it in the Arduino, the C++ program. And Essentially, we also connect this through WebSocket. So as you can see, this is just a simple script of being able to connect through WebSocket, basically showing like some string hand fingers plus the palm and like printing that out. And essentially, afterwards, we're just connecting to a particular uh, socket, as you can see over there. And we're sending it towards, uh, we're sending the string hand towards the WebSocket and essentially we're just closing it. And of course, we go to the main component as well, which is essentially being able to control the robotic arms as well. And eventually also, as you can see over there, we have some stuff like um, controller, listener, that's where we're all calling that. And we're just adding, more. we can also add listeners to the controller. So essentially, this is where we also kind of like just add towards a new instance of when the robotic arm is detected as well. So. Of course, and the other stuff is just please stuff, explanatory stuff like yeah, just quitting the current execution of the robot, so and stuff like that, and essentially removing the listener at the end. Moving a bit to C++, so essentially we have a few servo constants here as well. So these are all the things that like need to be taken into consideration as well when we are uh, obtaining coordinates and the data from the robot. So stuff like the servo pins, the servo correction. Uh, minimal position, maximum position, uh, motion, minimum position, maximum position as well, and essentially also the rotation, and is essentially also defining the total uh, instances of the servo, which is eight different servos in this case. And this is where we basically uh, retrieve the, we uh, the WebSocket message, where we, we receive as well through WebSocket, and essentially, as you can see, we have an on WebSocket event over here, and essentially we're taking into the parameters like number, type, payload, and in the end, we also, from here, make a kind of like just the identification of like the, if the client has its connected or connected, as you can see over here, and also just detecting the IP in general and controlling the servo itself. This is how we essentially control it. Basically, we loop over the different servo data. Basically, as you can see, we have left, right, pitch, roll, yaw, as mentioned before as well. And basically, from here, we're able to also identify the current servo con positions. So, for example, in this one, because in a normal servo, like 
Balanced is not zero, so that's why I have 90 there. And essentially, from 90, which is the balanced position, we're pretty much just correcting it through the movement currently and with servo current position. So that's why, how it is able to determine the current position, essentially by being able to move it back and forth that way. And essentially, that's how they detect the current position. And also, Otherwise, we can also see else as well with it going the other way. And aside from that, we're also able to see that we also have an its if statement as well. Uh, and essentially what the latter two formula means is basically kind of like a detection, basically if, uh, basically to be able to record like, uh, if it thinks like it's going a bit too far, it can kind of like just make the movements gradual because sometimes when our hands move, we don't like move it very gradually. Sometimes we just want to move it something like just like dark like that, and like the, the robot doesn't take it like, too good usually, and it sometimes ends up breaking stuff. So, like that's why we have to like have a gradual formula for this, which is why I made uh, just a reduction between the current position and the previous position, and in the end, like making the max palm ser server deviation as well, like how how far can it actually tilt or how far can it actually move? Uh, what's the maximum movement that it can make before it decides to, it will stop. And of course, self connection as well. So the same thing with for wet socket, basically being able to uh, retrieve a serial port and basically in the end, a be able to just uh, move as well, like for the movement as well. So set the servo initial position from yeah 90 degrees uh, and essentially be able to also move it from there. So taking the data back from the Python script. And we're put a few delays as well, I can see over there. And of course, final part is connecting to the access point. So just a few commands as well, just to show the um, serial port uh, that we're connecting to the service and also showing stuff like, yeah, uh, when we start to also input uh, stuff like the Wi-Fi and set host name, which uh, we can set as well through here, and also put a few delays as well when we're connecting as well, just to uh, be on the safe side. So that's the end of the whole project area. And uh, basically, what are future, future, uh, potential future project areas? Uh, be cloud-based, uh, utilize microservices, definitely. Um, it's especially important as well, as I mentioned before, uh, to be able to utilize more IoT-based applications. Uh, I attempted to use one particularly called PubNub as well, essentially being able to upload data towards PubNub and essentially be able to uh, retrieve the coordinates from there. So in the end, being able to also like, retrieve the data from there and uh, perform analytics based on the current uh, performances based on the data so far. So that's potential future area to also like look into future implementations, potentially controlling from the internet as well. And of course, uh, create operations metrics. It's always important to have analytics because you're able to also like analyze how your program, programming has done and basically like what you can still optimize in your code or performance that has currently made. And of course, well, potentially, maybe it could one day reach uh, the whole stage of uh, being a Pacific Rim robot, maybe, as we can see over here. Honestly, this was still one of the diagrams that has like, still quite like, uh, intrigued me about like, the possibilities of being able to eventually build a Pacific Rim robot, as you can see over here. The arm is just one part of it, but with this uh, potential thing uh, that already currently here, it's not hard to envision a future where we're able to see robots that could actually do the same thing, could, that could even uh, be like those giant-sized robots that could just walk the Earth. So it's a pretty cool thing to imagine and build towards as well when we're uh, moving towards that future. And some future tips, further tips and tricks as well in Python for mechatronics. So uh, make smart systems, definitely. Uh, possibility as being cultural for everywhere, as, as I mentioned before. And definitely experiment with different sensors, see what works. And particularly also experiment with different uh, robotic arms as well, different brands. It's like some could work, some could, like uh, in particular, like this one has hands, but like uh, some of the industry ones also just have like just, just one claw like that. So that's another thing that is particularly interesting to look into as well, if you're more of an uh, industry-based kind of like uh, setting. And of course, but this is also potentially uh, very useful for industry as well at this point, because well, 
has fingers now. So, and also, of course, get the most from analytics, being able to utilize analytics. Uh, if you use service like AWS, PubNub, uh, Azure, like if you run your services through there and connect service through there, like it's definitely very uh, important to be able to like uh, retrieve analytics, uh, optimize and um, make further improvements from there. So uh, it's the demo time now. So uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, would anyone care to volunteer to try out the robotic arms? Any volunteers? Okay, please come up. And one more, is there any more volunteers? Yep, please come up. Yep, so this is the sensor and Basically, all you need to do is move your hands here and just place your arms. Yeah. Yep, just, uh, just yeah, okay. yep. Hopefully this works because I haven't tested this yet. <laughs> so just move or? Yeah, it should be working. Uh, actually, uh, may I think there may be something. Uh, may I? It may be actually be disconnected. <laughs> Hold on, yeah. Uh, let me just quickly try. Hmm, that's odd. Oh, that's odd. Uh, it's already programmed to currently work from the from this hotspot. Uh, it, no, because like it works from the local hotspot. So, like uh, it's currently programmed to work from this hotspot. So I'm just not sure why my hotspot is not showing up currently, and it showed up previously. So it's kind of uh, strange. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I guess I can just take questions for now. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, some technical problems. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. So uh, we have one question from Jin Mei. Okay, so. Uh, why would a more functional programming style instead of object-oriented be less appropriate for robotics or mechatronics? I suppose it's really more to uh, personal preference. So like I said, uh, like experimenting with all these uh, programs is all about being able to uh, basically try out like different styles of programming. And essentially, like uh, functional programming-wise, like I would say that it's always, uh, it's always like a kind of like a choice as well because uh, in the end, like some functional programming uh, and like object oriented, we're able to uh, like uh, make things into like more components and kind of like just more like uh, yeah, uh, basically like put them into like different objects and make it more structured that way. So uh, I would say that like uh, it's just my prefer personal preference to like use it in that sense. But for functional programming wise, it's also po definitely possible. So uh, it's always a matter of preference, I'd say. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Renaldi. Thanks, thanks, Renaldi. Okay.